while I start, thank you, I like attention very much, thank you. While I start, we are going to be getting some food on your table because we know that you will pay closer attention if you have things to eat and drink, so we want you to be comfortable. So good evening and welcome. For those of you who don't know me, which I hope is not very many because I have been trying to get around and greet everybody, my name is Linda Mizan. And I have the privilege of being the chair of the Accounting Standards Board here in Canada, but more importantly, tonight I have the privilege of being the one who gets to welcome you first to this event that is jointly hosted by the Accounting Standards Oversight Council and the IFRS Foundation trustees. So welcome. As you can imagine, this event has been some months in the planning. When I look back through my file on this event, I found one of the, the first of many emails that have been exchanged with the folks in London, and we were agreeing on the topics for one of our first organizational calls. That email was dated November 18th of last year, so you can see that this event has taking, taken a, a fair amount of time and effort to put together so that we could be sure we had such a distinguished audience for tonight's event. I do recall on that first organizational call as the folks from London were explaining how the week's activities would typically unfold, they mentioned their desire to plan some activities for the foundation trustees that might involve local cultural events. And then in the next breath, they asked me if the Maple Leafs or the Blue Jays would be playing at this time of year. So, I wasn't quite sure how to feel about that. Um, Canadian culture being equated to Toronto sports teams. Uh, but I can tell you that I knew enough about the Maple Leafs that I told them that I wasn't sure. Which doesn't really make me an expert on hockey, but it, I've lived here for a long time now, so I recognize a pattern. When I was asked to open the session, I knew exactly what I, my focus would be, and my focus is on you, our invited guests, and telling you about who's in the room for this important evening. Uh, but these are unaudited results, for, so for all the audit partners in the room, don't start counting, okay? We have just over 160 people, which I am told is a slightly larger number than, than typically happens in these events. So thank you for your willingness to come tonight. We have people from the following geographies in Canada, and I believe I've gotten this in the right alphabetical order. We have Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Ontario, Quebec, and Saskatchewan. We have guests from the US, we clearly have guests from the UK, and we have the global membership of the IFRS Foundation trustees. So for those who have traveled to get here tonight, we thank you very much. Describing you from another perspective, we have academics, accounting firms, and actuaries. We have people from financial services, telecommunications, mining, pensions funds, private equity, real estate, entertainment, utility, and pipelines. We have folks from CPA Canada who support us from a funding perspective that allow us to do the work that we do from an international and domestic standard setting perspective. We have securities and prudential regulators, and clearly we have standard setters, oversight bodies, bodies internationally from the US and domestically. And a final few observations. It is pleasing to me that we've attracted a strong group of very senior finance individuals, preparers who participated in a very strong transition to IFRS, and who continue to display leadership in financial reporting. We have many very senior audit partners with us tonight from outstanding Canadian firms who support their clients, who dealt not only with the transition to IFRS, but also the transition to international auditing standards at the very same, same time. And those firms also support the ACSB's work on a very regular basis, and we thank you for that. We have corporate directors here who directly participate in strong corporate governance. We have some CEOs here tonight. And we hope that you listen, hopefully patiently, to all of the changes that your finance people tell you about accounting. And we're glad that you could be here tonight uh, to spend time with us discussing the Canadian perspective on global standards. We have risk management and treasury professionals who lived through the IFRS transition as a global credit crisis was occurring. We have people who serve on ISB advisory committees who help provide the Canadian perspectives directly to the ISB. 
We have the Bank of Canada, OSFI, securities regulators who so actively participate in the financial reporting regime in Canada. We have over half of our members of our oversight council and all but one of the accounting standards board members present. Um, and it's important to note that these people devote significant time and effort in volunteering their expertise to support the important role of standard setting, a significant portion of which is spent on working with the ISB and IFRS. Collectively, you all make the Canadian financial reporting landscape what it is, very strong and disciplined, which means that we have a financial reporting environment that goes beyond the weight we might carry given that our country represents just over 3% of global capital markets, which leads to an often used expression that Canada punches above its weight. By any measure, you are an impressive group, and I very humbly thank you for being willing to take your time and spend it with us, with us this evening, especially since many of you are in the midst of quarter end closing, and we know, and I remember, just how busy a time that is. Lastly, I have a few people to thank, and by no means is this list exhaustive, and there will be other thanks during the evening. I'd like to thank Michelle Prada and Hans Hugerwurst, both of whom you'll meet soon, and the entire IFRS Foundation for coming to Toronto. A special thanks to our own Canadian trustee, Sheila Fraser, for helping make this happen. Sheila has always offered me her time, her advice, and counsel, and we feel blessed to have such a knowledgeable Canadian representing us as a trustee. Thanks to all the ISB members who are here this week who attended a host of meetings, Stephen Cooper, Daryl Scott, and Mary Tokar. Thanks to the Foundation staff, Yael Almog, Mark Bide, and Jenny Kale, who have worked so diligently with us as we manage through all the planning. Thanks to my own, own ACSB staff, what you see on the table was all a product of their work, and we, we thank you very much. And two very personal thanks. Um, to my Director of Standards, Rebecca Villeman, and to my Vice Chair, Karen Higgins, for all the effort that they put into the last week. And obviously, I need to thank the Oversight Council and the Accounting Standards Board for their support. Now, I'll simply point out that you have a program in front of you, so please follow along. And in the interest of keeping us on time, I will introduce our first speaker. Michelle Prada has been the chairman of the IFRS Foundation trustee since 2012, but has been actively involved in supporting IFRS much longer, serving on the initial nominating committee that selected the new body of trustees in 2000. He was also a leading proponent of the European adoption of IFRS in 2005. He previously served as chairman of the Securities Regular in France for 12 years and as the chairman of the Executive and Technical Committees of IASCO and was a founding member of the Financial Stability Forum, which is now the Financial Stability Board. There are many more accomplishments that I could list, but, but perhaps I'm not going to do this, but just add my own thoughts, having just met Michelle on Monday. Michelle, you are very knowledgeable. You are a fine gentleman and very gracious and spending all day on Monday meeting with Canadian stakeholders. And we are absolutely delighted that you could be here with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Prada. Thank you, Linda, for your very kind words. I have to say that each time I come to Canada, not very frequently from time to time, I feel at home. It happens that long ago, that was in the early 60s, I spent uh, two years in Paris studying, and I had a room in uh, what we called La Maison du Canada, at the international campus of Paris. And during these two years, uh, I met with French and English-speaking Canadians, and we had discussions late in the night. That was a period of time where heated discussions would be uh, developed between students, and I kept a host of very good friends in Canada, both uh, in Quebec and elsewhere, and here in Toronto. So, it's really a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I have to add that yesterday's meetings and today's meetings have been remarkable, and I just want to express my gratitude to you all 
for these meetings that were extremely interesting and enlightening. But ladies and gentlemen, this uh, evening's event is being held in memory of our excellent colleague, Harvey Goldschmidt. Harvey had only taken over from Bob Glauber since early January uh, as vice chairman of the IFRS trustees when he died in February this year. He had also accepted to succeed Scott Evans and chair our due process oversight committee, a strategic body which is of the essence for the good functioning and credibility of our organization. Harvey was a truly remarkable person. He, in so many different ways, and his demise was a shock to all of us. Harvey spent the vast majority of his professional life serving the public interest. As a senior staff member, then a commissioner at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, Harvey worked tirelessly to advance the cause of investor protection in a globalized market. Through his work at Columbia University, Harvey was also one of the world's most respected academics in the field of corporate law and securities regulation. He educated generations of lawyers and judges. He was proud of their success and would remain in touch with them, advising them and following their careers. Indeed, many of today's market regulators, including several people in this room, honed their skills under his inspirational professorship. Harvey used to say that the most important part of teaching was, I quote, to think about not only what the law is, which students need to know, but what it ought to be. His philosophy extended outside of the classroom into the way that he committed to shaping the regulation of financial markets internationally. This philosophy led him to become involved in the work of the IFRS Foundation and the IASB. Back in 2008, Hans Uggevorst, together with Harvey, and Hans at that time was chairman of the Dutch securities regulator, both served as co-chairman of the Financial Crisis Advisory Group, formed to advise the IASB and the FASB on their joint response to the financial crisis, and some of you remember that period. I also served as a member of that group, together with Tommaso Padoaschiopa, my predecessor. I remember thinking at the time that Harvey's wise judgment, together with his calm and courteous diplomacy, was instrumental in steering the group away from the knee-jerk reactions to the crisis and to take a thoughtful, longer-term perspective. To paraphrase Harvey, what financial reporting ought to be. Together with Hans, he designed the new approach to a mixed attribute model for financial instruments. And he set up the difference between prudential regulation which aimed at a dynamic management of provisioning and accounting that should remain a faithful description of reality, including well-justified analysis of expected loss. Then, in 2010, Harvey agreed to become a trustee of the IFRS Foundation. Once again, his dedication and counsel helped his fellow trustees to keep the IFRS project of global standards on an even keel. The period since 2010 has seen a great deal of background noise about IFRS and global standards from all parts of the world. Anyone that has been involved in any form of international standardization will tell you that it is very much two steps forward, one step back. Since 2010, we have seen various difficulties in Europe hopes for IFRS in the U.S. raised and dashed, as well as other progress and challenges around the world. Throughout this period, Harvey's calm, measured belief in the compelling logic of global standards has helped us to avoid responding to the noise and instead keeping resolutely focused on our long-term goal as set up by the G20 leaders in their London and Pittsburgh meetings. 
This advice has served us well and has strongly contributed to the remarkably successful story of IFRS. We will remain faithful to his vision and keep in our minds his advice in the years to come. More than anything, Harvey was a kind, warm, and optimistic person. For such an accomplished person, he was also totally unselfish with his time and loved to help others. His memory will live long in the hearts of the trustees and staff of the foundation, as well as to the many others that had the good fortune to spend time in his company. So this evening is dedicated to Harvey Goldschmidt, one of life's true public servants, as well as a thoroughly decent person. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you to join me in raising a glass to his memory. Ladies and gentlemen, um, distinguished guests, uh, it is truly a great uh, honor and joy to be here with you tonight. Canada is truly a very important member of the global IFRS community. You have been a long-term supporter of our work even before the ISB really started. And over the years, we have benefited from Canadian trustees, currently Sheila Fraser, a Canadian member of the IASB, and Canadian members of the Interpretations Committee. Canada has delivered Paul Cherry, I see him there, as chairman of the IFRS Advisory Council, and most recently, Linda Meason joined our Accounting Standards Advisory Forum. And because of this uh, strong Canadian presence, you can rest assured your thoughts and your ideas truly permeate our work. And what I would like to add, Canada is really a force, a progressive force in accounting. You are not afraid to modernize, and that is something that we really need in an accounting world that tends to be deeply conservative. My opening uh, remarks this evening will begin by focusing on the mission of the IFRS Foundation and the IASB. And I will then provide you with an update on the progress that we make towards establishing global standards. And finally, I will make some closing remarks about revenue recognition, which we are doing with our dear friends from the FASB, and uh, insurance accounting. First, our mission statement. You see it in front of you. It is a black and white piece of paper. Until now, we did not really have one. Uh, our constitution formulates some objectives, but in highly technical terms. And it does not really explain the why of our work. Why is our work so important, and how do we serve the public interest? In the last couple of months, I have led a small project to distill our raison d'être into a few paragraphs. And we held many meetings. We, I began with uh, meetings with the staff. I started out with a complicated text of 360 words, and we ended with 200 words that everybody could understand. They have been refined and improved with input from many others, including the trustees and the advisory council and you have the uh, result now uh, in front of you. The mission statement does not change our constitutional objective, but it does help others and also ourselves to better understand our role in the global economy, the reason why we do what we do. And the first paragraph really says it all. Our mission is to develop IFRSs that bring transparency, accountability, 
and efficiency to financial markets around the world. Our work serves the public interest by fostering trust, growth, and long-term financial stability in the global economy. And this is our mission in a nutshell. It could stand by itself. The mission statement goes on to explain that our standards bring transparency by enhancing the quality and international comparability of financial information. And that enables investors and other market participants to make informed economic decisions. Our standards also strengthen accountability by reducing the information gap between the providers capital of capital and the people to whom they have entrusted their money. So standards provide information that is needed to hold management to account. It's basically another, you could also describe it as the stewardship principle. Finally, IFRS contributes to economic efficiency by helping investors to identify opportunities and risks around the world. And the result should be a more efficient allocation of capital and, and, and higher economic growth. For businesses, the use of a single trusted accounting language lowers the cost of capital and reduces international reporting costs. Today, the Japanese government issued a study, published a study among voluntary uh, Japanese, company, Japanese uh, adopters of IFRS, and their main motivation is that they really want to have one accounting language for all their subsidiaries around the world. It improves the way in which they can manage their companies. So, while we always say that investors are the primary audience of our work, and they are, uh, our work brings economic gains to both investors and preparers. And that is the public good of IFRS, our contribution to the world economy. And these words serve as a reminder to all of us to look beyond the pursuit of accounting ideologies or national interests. And I look forward to discussing this further during the panel discussion. So, what is the actual progress that we are making on the path to global standards? And you will find the answer again on the table uh, in, uh, the front of, in front of you in a form of a small gift from the IASB. And it's the latest version of the IFRS pocket guide, hot of the press. And the guide provides an authoritative assessment of the use of IFRS around the world. The pocket guide shows that of the 138 countries that we researched, 114 require already the use of IFRS for all or almost all publicly listed companies. In Europe, IFRS is now a decade-old news story, and it is almost business as usual. The European Commission has just completed a survey of Europe's experience of IFRS in the last decade, and the vast bulk of responses to the survey spoke favorably of IFRS, including from the companies that at first thought it was a tremendous burden to convert. They really now realize what a big asset it is to them. In Latin America and also in Africa, IFRS has also become well entrenched. Pretty much every Latin American country already uses IFRS. And the same is true in Africa. All of the high growth African economies are fully on board with IFRS. In Asia, the dynamics of IFRS are still in full swing. Three quarters of all countries across the Asia Oceania region already require the use of IFRS. And it is true, of course, that some major e Asian economies still have to complete their transition to full IFRS. However, we have begun to see some very exciting developments in some of these countries. I just spoke of Japan. Japan has permitted the use of IFRS since 2007. And in the last two years, the voluntary use of IFRS has taken off explosively. Just last month, IFRS overtook US GAAP as the main non-Japanese accounting standard in Japan. And by the end of the year, it is expected that more than 20% of the total market capitalization of Japan will have moved to IFRS. And I, 
there's a big possibility that after that the, the, the developments will accelerate further. The progress is much faster than anyone had expected. When I took office as uh, chairman, only four Japanese companies used IFRS. The Indian government has also begun its own convergence program with IFRS. From 2017, listed Indian companies will be required to report using the new Indian accounting standards, which largely follow IFRS. Give or take seven carve outs. <laughs> And of course, we don't like that. And we will continue to work closely with our colleagues in India. And we remain hopeful that Indian standards will end up being fully aligned with IFRS. If one country, if one country could immediately raise the credibility of its financial markets by adopting IFRS, it is India. China is also a very important member of the IFRS family. And although account, the Chinese accounting standards, and especially the, the, the ones that were um, translated from the older IFRS standards, uh, they are not word-for-word -word IFRS, but they are much closer than many people realize. In addition, more than 250 Chinese companies, equivalent to about 30% of the total Chinese market cap, um, already use IFRS in their dual listings in Hong Kong. And in most cases, the financial reporting differences of these companies when, re when reporting using Chinese GAAP versus IFRS are negligible. It's behind the comma. Here in Canada, IFRS has become well entrenched. Canada showed remarkable vision and leadership in financial reporting when it decided to adopt IFRS from 2011. Because of the close ties between Canada and the United States, I can understand that it was not an easy decision. It was a very big decision. The United States is Canada's largest single trading partner. While companies representing around 62% of the total Canadian market cap are also listed in the United States. And given these ties, it must have been especially disappointing for Canada that since the momentous decision to allow foreign listers to use IFRS, there has been, until now, no further breakthrough for IFRS in the United States. The SEC is now pondering a fourth way forward with IFRS, and we will have to see what the exact proposals will entail. The good news is that the SEC still support, uh, supports the goal of a single set of global standards. And another, more importantly, what many people feared uh, has a, a, a backlash uh, around the world in terms of IFRS as a result of the, uh, the stalemate in the United States. It has not happened. As I explained to you, the momentum of IFRS outside the United States has not gone into reverse, quite the opposite. So I believe that Canada's courageous decision to adopt IFRS has been more than vindicated. The most remarkable about the advance of IFRS is not so much the number of countries applying it. The most remarkable is to what, that's contrary to what many people believe or like to believe, there are very few local adaptations. Our study shows that modifications are rare, and where they exist, they are mostly transitory in nature, such as here in Canada, where you had a temporary delay around rate regulation. I know of no other international economic standard that is used so widely and consistently around the world. And that is truly remarkable. The 114 countries using IFRS have among them hugely different economic and legal systems. A rules-based environment is often seen as an insurmountable barrier to principle-based accounting. I can assure you that the vast majority of IRS, IFRS jurisdictions have a rule-based culture. There's actually only a very small pocket of countries in Northern Europe where they have more of a principle-based culture. Most of the world is rules-based. And nevertheless, these countries can work with IFRS perfectly well. And they are living proof that there is no objective reason for national exceptions to international norms. 
The third and final topic I want, want to cover this evening is to mention a couple of major projects on the ISB work plan, just very briefly. With our friends of the FASB, we have started a transition resource group to support implementation of the revenue standard. And we are currently working to see whether any targeted or limited adjustments are needed to IFRS 15, and we have already identified a few. And where clarifications are needed, we should make them. However, we need to be careful that this process does not end up with the boards revisiting the fundamentals that underpin the standard. Completing IFRS 15 took more than a decade of hard work by both boards. Three formal rounds of uh, consultation, public consultations, thousands of hours of meetings and countless outreach meetings. We cannot have a state of a permanent state of standard setting. So uh, I am sure that uh, we will do our best uh, with our American colleagues to uh, to uh, avoid a situation of endless tinkering with the standard. It will not bring the standard to perfection. We are also working hard to in introduce a new standard for insurance accounting. And that is also a project that has been going on for years, since 1997. It is high time that we bring it to an end. We have been working in close cooperation with the in insurance industry around the world, including here in Canada, um, to, to make it happen. And I think in the process we have been able to take away a lot of the angst of the uh, Canadian insurance uh, industry about the form of our standard. I'm sure that till the last moment there will be objections and doubts and etc. But I think we've come a long way. We have also uh, made very pr good progress in March by exploring a workable solution for partic participating contracts, which was one of the last remaining issues. So I'm very optimistic we will be able to finalize our deliberations in the coming months. I am well aware that Canada is in the somewhat unique position of being an IFRS jurisdiction that requires the use of quarterly reporting. And that means that Canadian companies are often in the position of being the first in the world to uh, use IFRS uh, standards. And because of this, and I know it has caused some problems, especially around IFRS 11 and, and, and 12. Uh, so we really have to make sure this doesn't happen again and that you can do your work in an orderly fashion. So um, I'm sure we'll take, talk about that in the, in, the, uh, in the panel discussion further. Ladies and gentlemen, I've come to the conclusion of my comments. I, I really thank you for your time. Uh, and I uh, hope that I provided enough juicy uh, topics for the uh, panel discussion that we're going to have now. Thank you very much. Whether I can read them in this light is another thing. Okay, if, if we could begin, please, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And good, ne good evening, everybody, and, and welcome. Uh, my name's Kevin Nye, and I'm your moderator uh, this evening for a panel discussion on the Canadian perspective on IFRS. You have an event program in front of you, so I won't go through the, the biographies of the panelists. I will introduce them, uh, going from my right to further right, I guess that is. Um, first of all, Brad Darling, Hans Hugerverse, Barb Stymius, Doug Hyman, and Bill McFarlane. Before we begin, uh, Hans, I'd like to thank you for your very kind comments this evening, acknowledging Canada's contribution to the international IFRS community, and also uh, to note our intent to continue to do so in the future. So thank you for that. So let's begin. Adopting IFRS here in Canada has been a journey that we started in 2004 and continue on today. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to touch on our approach to adopting IFRS. In some countries, uh, such as Afri South Africa, um, you know, they incorporate ISB standards uh, or pronouncements into law automatically when issued. 
On the other hand, uh, places like the EU have extensive and sometimes lengthy endorsement processes, including parliamentary approval. In Canada, we ask one question. The Accounting Standards Board asks its stakeholders, is there any reason these IASB proposals might be appropriate elsewhere in the world, but not here in Canada? So the question to you, Doug, is do you feel we have the appropriate balance in that approach? Well, thanks very much, Kevin. I just say a couple of things first. That uh, I was asked to come and provide a regulatory perspective, and I know a couple of my former regulatory colleagues are in the audience who they may want to disavow everything I say. So what I'm saying are my personal opinions. Um, secondly, I just note that Hans uh, made the comment about Canada having made a courageous decision to adopt IFRS. Anyone who was a fan of the old British uh, TV series, Yes, Minister, might recall that uh, whenever Sir Humphrey wanted to scare the minister off from making a decision, he, he would tell him, oh, minister, that would be a very courageous decision. <laughs> <laughs> so fortunately, Sir Humphrey wasn't around uh, at the time we were deciding to, uh, to bring IFRS into Canada. Um, in answer to your question, Kevin, I, I think we do have the balance right in Canada. Uh, it is obviously important that the uh, Accounting Standards Board, uh, for reasons of Canadian sovereignty, if nothing else, kind of retain the ultimate discretion on deciding what the accounting standards are that apply here. Uh, so putting each standard out and asking for comment on whether uh, there's any reason it would not be appropriate to adopt in Canada, I think is, is an appropriate thing to do. Um, and I think the process also contributes to the ability of Canadian market participants to, uh, to comment on, on standards that are, that are in the consultation process, um, helps to make sure that Canadian voices are heard. Um, we hear Hans's assurance that, uh, that our voices are heard, but, uh, but it is important to, uh, to get views in and, and try and help ensure that the standards that are ultimately adopted by the IASB are ones that will work here as well as everywhere else. Having said all of that, I think you know, it's important to think about the question about you know, when, if ever, would it be appropriate not to adopt one of the IASB standards. Um, it hasn't happened yet, and, and I would be surprised, unless the, uh, the board went haywire internationally, uh, that we would ever get to a, a situation where we would not want to adopt an IFRS standard. So I, you know, if I were moving off our current position, I would, I would be inclined more to move towards the South African position rather than towards the EU position. Okay, thanks, Doug. Hans, do you have any thoughts on that from what you see in other jurisdictions? Well, I, I wish that the European Union did it the Canadian way. <laughs> <laughs> I think you found the right balance. Uh, uh, you, uh, to not make it into a heavy politicized uh, procedure, but just to have the professionals uh, give advice to the government as, as to what to do, simple yes or no. Uh, and that, that gives you uh, at least a, a safety valve in the case that indeed the, uh, uh, the board would be taken over by zealots who uh, make completely ideological accounting standards. Uh, it could happen. Uh, and then you, then you have the liberty to uh, pull the plug. Uh, but that's, uh, that's where it is for and, and, and not for, for anything else. Okay, thank you for that. Clearly, uh, stakeholder engagement is critical in successful domestic implementation of international standards. Uh, with that, the Accounting Standards Board and the International Accounting Standards Board have extensive outreach programs and rigorous due process. Uh, the IFRS Foundation and the ISB members and staff go to great lengths to engage with stakeholders, including Canadian stakeholders, as you can see by this event tonight. And I guess the question for you, Brad, are you satisfied that the issues that are important to Canadians are being identified and dealt with by the ISB on a prompt manner? Thanks. Um, you know, from my vantage point as a user, um, I think there's a number of uh, outreach programs or touch points both on a formal and informal basis that allow Canadians some input into the perspectives of IFRS. Firstly, on the formal basis, I'd point to 
um, IFRS input into the subcommittees. First of all, I'd point to the user advisory committee where there's direct input in, and also on the insurance task force where there's a direct formal process for input into the IFRS standards. Then more in ter terms of my wheelhouse, when I look at the more informal input into the IFR standard setting processes are the outreach committees that happen through the investor communities. And these happen all throughout the world that myself and some of my colleagues have been a part of in terms of the standard setting process. And, um, and we, we feel these are very strong methods of investors having input into the process of the standard setters and directly get a sense of actually having input into the standards and ensuring that some of the regulators and all the, the parties that be understand the impact of the decisions being made. Good, thank you. Bill, have you any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, tonight's probably a really good example. Uh, you've got a packed house here, uh, more people than you might normally get, people very interested in providing input, uh, giving their perspective into standards. So I applaud um, the ISB for, for doing that because I think that's really, really uh, important. I think there's some good success stories uh, over the past few years. Uh, first of all, on uh, the investment entity uh, rules where Canada had a voice. There were round tables that took place. It was really around who to consolidate or not. Uh, I think on radio, regula regulated industries and utilities, there was some good dialogue and there's lots of dialogue going on right now in insurance in the insurance standards. Uh, more to come, I guess, with respect to that, although I, I heard earlier tonight, soon more to come. Um, and so I think those things are all positive. I think what I hear when I go out and talk to people, whether it's uh, clients I'm talking to, whether it's our directors, etc., I think the, the one point of view that's out there is, are there too many standards? Are we trying to do too much? And are we making the standards that we actually develop too complex? And, and so for me, from my perspective, from a listening perspective and, and what's out there, um, I'm just, I'm interested in the perspective of that for the standard setters because understandability of financial statements uh, is, is really important or otherwise we're not relevant. Hans, any thoughts on? First, about our due process. Mm -hmm. I have never been in an environment with such due process. Uh, when I was a minister, I would make far-reaching legislation. I would send it to Parliament. They would have three weeks to uh, ask questions, and we would, would answer those questions three weeks later. And if the bill was very complicated, then we would have a second round of uh, uh, questions. Then we would have a, a, a debate in Parliament, and you, you could basically get it done in one, less than one year. I did a major overhaul of the health insurance system in the Netherlands. And we did it in one year, uh, and, and, and the uh, website worked. But, uh, <laughs> but what we do is just incredible. Uh, and I think it's good, because you know, these are far-reaching standards. They are there to stay for a long time. We don't intend to tinker with it all the, long, all the time. We are only 15 uh, or 14 people at the moment, and you really know what is going on in, in real life, in, in practice, so we need to do this. But it is phenomenal what we do, and, and, and we really uh, give everybody a chance to talk to us. We, we, go, we travel all over the world. Uh, we have these lengthy uh, uh, written procedures, which gives people a lot of time. So I think all in all, I think also the perception is that the ISB these days listens pretty well. Um, and talking specifically about Canada, I'm, I'm not sure if we would be working on rate regulation if, if, if it were not that it was a big, really big case here, uh, here, here in Canada. So we do our best. Our standards too complicated? Yes, I, I, I sympathize with that. Yes. Okay, thank you, Hans. Now, one of the, uh, the issues for Canada, and this is something that, that you acknowledged in your comments, we're seeing situations in other jurisdictions around the world where the endorsement process for new IFRS results in adoption dates later than uh, what the ISB has, has pronounced. Um, you know, our current requirement here in Canada is that we adopt uh, the standards as issued, including the uh, implementation date. And this uh, then you know, ends up with Canadian companies being among the first in the world to adopt a standard 
uh, quite often without the benefit of any implementation guidance or you know learnings from other uh, companies who are adopting. Uh, for us, this increases the risk of restatements and further systems changes. And question for you, Barb, um, did you think it's feasible to achieve uh, a simultaneous adoption of standards, or do you think jurisdiction should retain control over the timing of implementation? Thanks, Kevin. So a, a couple of points. Um, it was great to hear Hans talk about the recognition in our quarterly reporting regime that Canada, of course, is one of the first to adopt. And I think one of the comments you didn't make is that there is an associated cost uh, to issuers uh, when they have to be the first to adopt. And I think that um, that lack of implementation guidance is both a cost and an opportunity. I think Canada has the chance to lead. Um, I'd say that is the opportunity that we can uh, be a strong influence as we deal with the implementation and shape the implementation guidance. I think that the cost can be somewhat mitigated and I would challenge the uh, representatives from the public accounting firms, uh, the global firms who are dealing with the matter that they really need to speed up their processes to have implementation guidance that is ready for the earliest uh, period in which the standards are adopted. But I go back to the fundamental question that, that we're really grappling with and, and that's to ensure and I think the advice um, and I think it's reasonably well done but the advice to the IASB is that when these standards are highly complex to implement that we need to have a suitable time frame uh, so that the implementation issues can be dealt with well. Uh, so being conscious of, of having a long enough time period to implement will allow all jurisdictions, I think, to um, achieve the implementation more smoothly and have less reliance on the implementation guidance that would be necessary. So I think on balance, um, it's, it's, it's a system that works very well. Um, I would not suggest that Canada will move away from quarterly reporting, which does lead us, leave us out there as being first. Uh, but I think that uh, what we can, and I think the challenge, of course, that's been referred to already this evening is the challenge of Europe uh, lagging behind. But I think given the pervasiveness of the IFRS standards that we now um, have enough jurisdictions that can do the homework and get it done and get it implemented well in Canada will remain one of those jurisdictions. Super. Hans? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, yes, the endorsement process in Europe is uh, heavy and, and, and can be a bit lengthy, but this is the first time it has happened that they have delayed uh, implementation of a standard. So it's not the norm. Normally, they just uh, end up uh, endorsing, uh, and I expect that to continue in the future. So it, w it was a, a, a bit of a one-off, I, I hope. And I think the lesson we have to learn is, well, first of all, let's try to do our work a little bit better so that these implementation issues simply don't arise. Uh, it was a complicated standard, and, uh, and I think uh, we may have underestimated some of the problems. Uh, and secondly, indeed, uh, give people uh, sufficient time to prepare. Uh, I, you know, I, I also always think it's more important to get a standard done than to have a very hasty, uh, effective date. Uh, so, and for insurance, that's also going to be a, an important issue. Bill or Doug, do you have any thoughts on that? The only other thing that I would add with respect to that is, uh, so I'll take your challenge, first of all, uh, Barb, <laughs> uh, with respect to the, uh, the, the, the uh, major firms uh, getting the implementation uh, guidance out there. I think one of the challenges that we have is, as the rules change, from exposure draft to final drafts, etc., we need enough time to be able to look at them and interpret them and it's always more challenging when you're in a more principle based uh, you, you know set of set of standards versus rule based which uh, probably the US is, 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 is closer to but having said that um, I, I think it's important from uh, companies reputational perspective to make sure that we do take the time so I just reiterate what, what you said um, because uh, making mistakes or not getting the interpretations the same throughout the globe, uh, you know, can hurt us from a, a Canadian perspective. And our Canadian, 
companies uh, you know, raise a lot of money abroad and, and they don't always understand some of the intricacies. So we want to make sure that we, I think companies want to make sure that they do things in a very balanced manner and they have the time to put the right effort into it to get it right. Doug? Yeah, I would only add that I, I agree with, with what Barb said. I think we should, we should look at the half full part of the glass here, that it's an opportunity and, and as much as, uh, as a challenge to be the first adopter. Uh, and I think these are issues that can be dealt with and I certainly would not uh, favor moving to any system where we delay. Uh, and one important thing, of course, to think about in Canada is that, that the SEC's acceptance of IFRS is IFRS as issued by the IASB. So we don't want to get out of sync with that by having later adoption dates. Good, good point, thank you. Uh, certainly not surprisingly, when international standards get discussed, the subject of convergence uh, with US GAAP comes up. Now, the ISB and FASB have worked hard to develop converged standards, including revenue from contracts with customers. Uh, Bill and Brad, a couple of questions. Should the ISB focus, sorry, should the ISB focus, uh, focusing its efforts primarily on maintaining uh, convergence among those countries that have adopted IFRS, that being uh, try to minimize or avoid national interpretations, um, can we live with two sets of standards? And what should the priority be for the ISB and FASB uh, relative to uh, convergence? You want me to start with, uh, start with that one? First of all, I, you know, I'd, I'd start with the, the point that uh, certainly from a firm perspective, and I think my own personal perspective, one global standard would be utopia, and you know, that's what we like. Uh, then I step back for a second and I say, well, is that practical and is that actually what's going to happen in the near term? And I think the answer to that is no. Uh, it's probably highly uh, you know, un un unlikely. Uh, the last time I looked, uh, the U.S. hadn't moved to the metric system either. And, and, and uh, so I, I think uh, there are lots of reasons probably for that. Um, and, and so then when you think that that is the dynamic or the world that you're actually playing in, I think the focus on making sure we implement IFRS consistently in the, comp in the countries where it's been adopted is, should actually be the number one focus, uh, focus area. I think that's critical. Uh, I think uh, we all believe that having consistency, uh, comparability, you know, uh, adds to quality and adds to, you know, the, how uh, the, the user experience from uh, the various users of the, of, the, of the financial statements. So I think that's really, really, really critical. Uh, I think that the standard setter should continue to try to converge uh, U.S. GAAP and, and IFRS, especially in relation to major projects, uh, you know, that have either been underway or, or, or future ones that are out there. So to have as few differences as possible is a huge positive, I think, for everybody. Um, but having said that, I think, you know, some of the uh, recent um, developments around whether it's the revenue standards or on lease accounting where you know there's going to be a uh, different approach used with respect to the P&L uh, I think that tells us uh, that yes try to narrow them uh, be on, and converge US GAAP and, and, and IFRS but don't be impractical so I'd spend more of my attention on trying to get IFRS more consistent right around the world. Bill, I would agree with that. Uh, like w within IRFRS, we should focus on limiting the amount of national discrepancies across the board wherever possible. Like as global investors, we're really trying to compare all of our companies on an apples to apples basis. And to the extent that there are national discrepancies around the world, if anything, it, in my mind, it would reduce the, the consistency and the comparability and the, the, this global standard we're creating of IFRS. So to the extent we can minimize those national discrepancies, absolutely. In the context of... Uh, IFRS and US GAAP. I understand there's a lot more challenges in converging towards US GAAP, that's pretty clear. But I think it should be a, a major goal to, to head towards convergence over time because you know, it is a global market for access to capital. And uh, you know, the extent that you have two competitors competing in the same market, um, their, their, com their financials should be comparable for investors on our purposes. Okay, thank you for that. Another area that, should, should, sorry Hans? Should I perhaps say uh, Absolutely. something about the convergence has always been very difficult. I mean, I always say if I would split my board in two and they would both independently start setting standards, 
we would have di we would diverge probably uh, because you know it's a, it's a judgmental job. So it has always been difficult, um, but at least for much of the last decades we were on a common path to a single set of global standards. Now since that movement has stalled in the United States, convergence has become more difficult uh, because there seems to be less of an incentive. Uh, if you look at uh, the standards that we have been uh, uh, making, well, a big success was the revenue recognition that was completely converged. We are going to get some small divergences now probably, but not, not big. Overall, still a big success. I think leasing, if you look at the whole thing, is also still a success. Uh, yes, we differ on the income uh, statement treatment, but uh, the, the main thing to get leases on the balance sheet and the definition of a lease still completely converge. So I still consider that a, a success. Uh, the biggest disaster was financial instruments where we started converged and ended up diverged on many issues. And that is, uh, you know, given the importance of the financial industry, I think that is really a shame. Uh, going forward, um, we, we, we really have to try to keep the differences as small as possible in the interest of investors. That's who we both work for and we should keep that high in our, uh, uh, on, on, on the agenda. And it's also not good for the two boards to be too far apart because you get picked apart in, in, in the uh, standard setting. Uh, there will always be a tendency uh, to, for, for the markets to force us into the lowest common denominator. Uh, so it's not in our interest, and uh, that's why we have to continue working with the FSB to, to keep uh, differences as small as possible. One thing that we are going to look at jointly is uh, business combinations, treatment of goodwill, impairment of goodwill. Completely converged now. If, that, if, there, if we were going to end up diverged there, that would, I think, be a major disaster for investors uh, around the world. So I think that's a huge responsibility for us to, to get that done in a decent fashion. But there are no guarantees. Uh, I know uh, here in, in Canada it's hugely important given your special situation, given uh, all these companies that operate on two capital markets. So it has been really impressed on me in the last uh, two days that this is very important to you and it's an extra motivation. Mission accomplished, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another area that gets a lot of attention is non-GAAP measures. Uh, under old Canadian GAAP, there was a concern about the proliferation of non-GAAP performance measures. Barb, is this still an issue under IFRS? And if it is, who should deal with it, the standard setters or the regulators? So I, I'm not sure I would characterize it as an issue, but I think um, recognizing that there are two purposes for looking at two sets of numbers. So if I think about the uh, accounting framework, it is a framework that is applied to results that are done on a historical or looking back basis. And to me, then, the, uh, the opposite of that is the um, material that's highlighted generally in the MD&A um, that public issuers file that is the adjusted numbers. And I think the purpose of the MDNA um, for the analyst community and for the buy side community is to actually um, help guide people to understand what is the future um, or the expectations for normal uh, earnings capability or capacity going forward. And if you actually separate those two, um, you can see why there has been a huge proliferation of an attempt by the preparers and CFOs and, and, and management and boards to attempt to guide the market as well as they can about um, what is normal. And I guess I would be uh, probably showing my age if I didn't yearn for the day when we had the unusual and extraordinary item standards. So there may have been less need for what we now end up uh, turning ourselves into a pretzel on the, on the MDNA. Having said that there's really two purposes for um, the, the two sets of standards or, or the set of standards that, that are applied and then the use of non-GAAP financial measures. Because they are non-GAAP, I think they do fall outside um, the purview of the IFRS. Um, but I do think that uh, the proliferation of them um, is ripe with difficulties. 
Um, when I actually think about where we've landed, um, there's, there's a concept of equal prominence, and I actually don't think that, that adjusted earnings ever deserve equal prominence, and that's a personal view, um, because it is, there, there's only judgment being applied, not inside a framework, with no consistency <coughs> with anyone else, um, that is really meant to only guide future earnings. Whereas the view of what you're preparing in your quarterly and audited financial statements is against a framework, an accounting framework that's gone through a lot of due process. So one, to me, is, has far more rigor and therefore deserves the higher prominence. And so I would challenge, you know, perhaps some of the issuers in the room um, that, that really, to me, it's very bad form to have a headline that the adjusted earnings were X and to get to page seven before you can actually find what the gap earnings are. Um, you know, I, I really think that, you know, dividends are paid out of actual earnings and, uh, you know, and I, I, I've seen and I've seen for 20 years the variety and variability in what people choose to include in adjustments. And some of them are quite silly. I mean, people would move out stock-based compensation because there was some variability because they chose to move from cash to stock-based. It's not a cost of doing business. I mean, I, I just did not ever get the logic for why that would be an adjustment and I think still remains an adjustment. So your question about then who should oversee um, and, and bring some discipline to the market in terms of the use of adjusted earnings, I do think it belongs in the camp of the securities regulators, and I think that the OSC has been active on that front with their recent guidance, and I have encouraged some of the companies that I'm involved with to and that they, they internalize this, they adopt it, and they pay close attention to what the securities regulators are saying. So I think there's a long way to go in terms of improving the quality and consistency of adjusted earnings across industries and competitors. Um, I don't think we can let it run away, um, and I'm delighted to see the securities regulators and the reviewers of the financial statements that are filed in MD&As, um, you know, coming back with comment letters and, and, and in the full review process. So, so I don't think we're ever going to stop adjusted earnings, um, but I would encourage um, companies when they are reporting uh, their, their quarterlies and their annuals that at least on the front page that they include their gap earnings. Thank you for that. <laughs> Hans? Well, well, I agree with everything that Barbara said, except for one thing. I think we have a job to do as well. We don't have the ambition to stamp out um, just um, uh, non-gap measures because our standards are so generic uh, that I understand that preparers need something extra sometimes to present their numbers. So that's, that's fine. But it has gotten out of hand. Uh, Standards & Poor uh, just issued a report which clearly shows that 80% uh, of adjusted earnings are always positive. Always, it's always bigger than, uh, than, than reality. Uh, they take out uh, restructuring costs. I mean, restructuring costs is normal cost of doing business. Every company has to adjust continuously to economic modernization or to its competitors. It's something of every day. So you shouldn't take that out of your, uh, out of your earnings. Um, what we can do is... Um, First of all, in our own IAS 1, make clearer that you cannot give greater prominence uh, uh, to um, uh, non-GAAP measures than to IFRS numbers. I actually think you are right. They should have less prominence even, uh, and not just equal prominence. But often they, give, they, they, they get more prominence than uh, IFRS. So we have to look at that. That's what we're going to do. Also, I think we need to do some work whether we can ourselves fill in some of the gaps. We don't have a, uh, we don't have a, a definition of operating income. I know it's extremely difficult to do, but I think we should make an effort to fill the, fill the, gaps, uh, in, fill the gaps in gap ourselves. Yeah, I think there is a, an important opportunity there for standard setters to um, help set the standard as to how you develop those non-GAAP measures. I think they are here to stay, to, to what you talked about, um, and, and uh, because I think they're a big part of companies telling the story uh, around what's happening in, the, in, in their business, and, the, and, and I think that's uh, really, really uh, important. 
but I think to drive the consistency uh, that you'd like and to know that when you're looking at A versus B versus C, there is a level of uh, comparability there. I think it, I think is really, really uh, Im important and, and, you know, I was at a, talking to a, a couple of board members recently that said I'd like to compare our non-GAAP measures to the non-GAAP measures of uh, other companies within our industry and what are we doing differently, et cetera. So I think those conversations are important. I think there's a maybe, I don't know if I call it a void, but there's a gap there that uh, the standard setters could help fill. And I think also, if I put my own hat on as uh, in, the, in the auditing profession, I think there's an opportunity for us given that that's really important information for the marketplace to say uh, what level of assurance can we be placing on some of that data in addition to the information that's in the financial statements so that investors uh, you know, have the comfort around it uh, that they want, that they want and they need because they're using that information uh, to make business decisions. I, and uh, I would jump in as well. I think investors play a big part of uh, really pushing management teams on on the non-GAAP measures and the adjustments they're making to the non-GAAP measures. And you know, we consistently sort of not on the conference calls, but behind the scenes with management teams, really push the management teams of what they're doing in this fact here. And I'd like to throw out there that there may be some kind of a di dichotomy on who really uses non-GAAP measures quite often. A lot of longer-term shareholder, longer-term fundamental bottoms-up driven investors take the financial information as audited and do your own work with it over time. And I'd postulate that a lot of the shorter-term focus investors and the market that seems to be fixated on currently is driving off the non-GAAP measures currently. And these things are cyclical and they go in from time to time. And over time, um, something will go wrong in the biotech space or the high-tech space in the U.S. And these non-GAAP companies that are using a lot of non-GAAP measures today may be problematic in the future. So, you know, if anything, it may be uh, reverting back to the GAAP-based number and longer-term bottoms-up investing uh, that may come to prominence at some point in the future when, uh, when something happens. I think it would be useful, though, to acknowledge that there are valuable key performance metrics derived from financial information that are non-GAAP, and I think it's great discipline for organizations to look at return on equity or return on capital measures or gross margin percentages if you're in, in certain types of businesses. And there's nothing wrong with that. And so to me, there's actually really three categories. There's the audited, the IFRS, um, you know, historical view. There are key performance metrics that are valuable and show discipline and are derived from the financial statements. And then there's the um, the plethora of adjustments to, uh, to achieve an adjusted operating income where I think the real weaknesses are. So I just wanted to ensure that we think about it in two dimensions. Uh, there was one great line, of, one of many great lines in Warren Buffett's latest letter to his uh, uh, investors, which was that every, um, every manager that uh, referred to EBITDA as a, main, as a main performance indicator should be lined up to a polygraph test. <laughs> okay, moving <clears throat> on. Um, I'd like to touch on the level of activity uh, relative to international standards. The last three years were meant for the ISB to you know, kind of finish up on, on some of the major standing setting projects they had in process. Uh, and preparers and auditors were vetting down uh, numerous revised standards. Now, you know, that the ISB is approaching its second triennial um, agenda consultation. You know, the question, I guess, for Bill is, you know, is now for a period of, of calm? Are we ready for a period of calm? Um, and is it premature uh, to consider any fundamental change? think anybody in the room that has a role within uh, financial reporting would say we're anywhere close to a period of calm, uh, it is the, it, it, first of all, because I think there has been a lot of activity, uh, a lot of things happening, uh, and, and there are also some you know, very significant projects that are coming close to being completed at this point in time that are going to have some very significant implications to companies as far as impl implementation goes over the next few years. I think um, I sometimes have people say, well, isn't it time to take a break and do nothing for three to five years? Well, I think being realistic, uh, we all know in all of our businesses, things don't stand still and there's always change and you've got to react to the changes in the marketplace and there are different needs that obviously come up over a period of time. So doing nothing I don't think is a uh, option, uh, certainly at all. Uh, I think there will continue to be some level of activity. I think it will be important to get some of the major projects 
resolved and, and kind of behind us and get them implemented and, and, and uh, move forward on that before we pick up some other things. And I think from my perspective, what I'm hearing out there would be, um, from a number of people, would be the number of projects on the go, um, you know, in the future, should we think about, consider having fewer and making sure that the ones that we actually take on have a make more fundamental changes or slash have bigger impacts. And, and, and again, uh, maybe looking back to uh, the concept of, of a bit of an 80-20 rule that if it isn't going to have a, a, you know, a really big impact, is that where we want to spend you know, our time and energy some, given some of the other things that are happening. So I think that's just a, that's a reflection point for the board. It's a reflection point, uh, I think, for everybody in the profession to say how much change can you adapt to uh, over, over a period of time um, and, and also make sure that the things that we're doing are really having a big impact. Any comments there, Hans? Well, <clears throat> for those who wish us to do nothing, um, the, the, the good news is that the board, meet, the board weeks are already getting a little bit shorter now, now that some of the big projects have come off, off stream. Um, but I, I completely uh, agree with Bill. Uh, uh, we can never afford to go into a serious period of, uh, of calm. If only because the economy keeps changing all the time and you need to update your standards. Very good example for, uh, is, is pensions. In our pension standard we have a, a stark difference, dichotomy between defined contribution uh, and defined benefit. The reality these days is that most pension schemes are somewhere in the middle. And our standards, even though it has been recently uh, uh, changed, uh, doesn't really fit uh, uh, anymore. So, uh, and then we know, looking at our standards, that a lot of standards still have problems or are outdated. So we will have to work continuously. I think what 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 we might want to get better at is concentrating change around certain dates, so that com companies do not are not in a continuous mode of uh, adjusting and, and uh, uh, their, their, uh, their processes. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions from, from the audience, if there, if there are any. I'm not sure whether there's mics there, but oh, yes, we do. Uh, it's Phil Arthur. I'm, I have a question for Hans. Uh, I'm sort of quoting your mission statement that it's a common, you're developing a common language of financial reporting. You don't use the word, but one that is understandable. When you explain what you're doing to your mother, does she understand what you're doing? So, sorry, I couldn't, I, I couldn't when, understand. When, when you explain to your mother revenue recognition or insurance accounting, does she understand? I don't think so. <laughs> But I don't think we write um, uh, our standards with the idea that we are going to explain it to our granddad and grandmother. He understands. He's a smart boy. <laughs> I think we have one over here. There's one over here. Uh, Bob Muter, I'm on Axoc. Brad, this is a question for you. Uh, you've talked about convergence on the panel, and we know the degree that that's taken place, but the reality is we still got IFRS and uh, GAAP and the U.S. GAAP to yeah. deal with. So as a user investor, how challenging is that to you when you're making an investment decision and you're confronted with an array of companies, some of which are IFRS, some of which are U.S. GAAP? How challenging is that, and how do you approach dealing with that issue? Well, absolutely. Like, um, you know, this business was done a long time ago when there was a lot, many more uh, accounting standards around the world and it was always more difficult to be a global investor and compare your companies on an apple to apples basis. Um, all, what I would say is, you know, as time goes on and convergence takes place, it becomes easier and easier to compare your companies uh, on key metrics for valuation purposes, whether it's the balance sheet or the income statement from a gross margin perspective effectively. So I would say as convergence takes place more and more, it is easier for me to do my job from, from that perspective, um, but yet there may be less opportunities for uh, an active manager like me. It might be easier to do. Other questions? 
Thank you very much. Uh, my question has to do with the accountability of people making decisions on standards. Uh, I saw that in Australia, the government has decided to have the final say on any standard that you guys you will put together. So you might be proud of saying that you are independent people and you are making decisions without, without undue pressure and things like that. But how do you reply to people who would say that when you put independence to the limit, there is a lack of accountability? You are not accountable to anyone. So I'd like that to discuss what's your view about the way we do accept standard in Canada versus a, a country like Australia. And anyone could uh, try to reply. <clears throat> well, first of all, there is no such thing as unfettered independence. Uh, if we could just set our standards without taking anything into account except for our own opinions, that is not reality. So we listen carefully to uh, what, we, uh, uh, what we hear, and sometimes we make compromises, as in, for example, in insurance or, or in pension accounting, where we think, well, we, we really think the ideal answer is a little bit different, but we have to make progress, and perhaps the world is not co completely re ready yet for the perfect answer. So there is no unfettered uh, independence. We have to listen carefully. And we are accountable the, uh, uh, as well. We are accountable to our trustees, and we are accountable to the monitoring board, which consists of uh, uh, securities regulators uh, around the world. But I think it is important, too, that um, some countries, like, but also like Canada and, and, and Australia, I don't think are all that different, although in Australia it also goes through Parliament but in a very light procedure. Um, you, it is in, I, I can imagine that for many countries it is important to have that atomic weapon of non-endorsement in place uh, that you can use in extreme circumstances when you think that the board has gone ha haywire. It is one of the things that really uh, makes us um, uh, uh, accountable to the, uh, to the outside world, and I think there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I, I would say that you know one of the the roles of the Accounting Standards Oversight Council is to to be comfortable that the due diligence that the International Board has done uh, has been robust and you know meets the requirements for us to say yes you know we're we're comfortable with that and uh, you know we spent a lot of time looking at that. Doug, did you want to? Well, I was just going to say that there are different forms of accountability. Um, I mean, one is to have something go through Parliament, but I, the fact that they don't go through Parliament in Canada, I don't think means that, uh, that accounting standard setting isn't accountable. Um, I had the pleasure of chairing AXOC for uh, a few years uh, as one of Kevin's predecessors, uh, and it's a remarkable organ of accountability for the, the whole accounting standard setting process. They are volunteer members who sit on there, come from a variety wide variety of uh, parts of the community uh, and I think exercise uh, uh, you know very meaningful oversight over the process uh, of accounting standard setting in Canada which is in my view more effective than you're likely to get by running it through a political process. Thank you Doug. Okay I think we have we've got one more question. Thank you. Um, Accountability is clearly important, but that's different than a vowed political stance. What accountability is clearly important, but that's quite different than an avowed political stance. What does the current comments from the new incoming EFRAG chairman do to the process? I I have not quite, quite, but you referred to the comments that the new EFRAC chairman uh, has, has made uh, yesterday. And he said, I think he said that uh, his position was a political uh, position. I think, objectively speaking, that is true because it is part of a decision making process that is, in the end, political. It's, in the end, the standards are, um, are um, adopted by uh, uh, the European uh, Parliament, or it in, at least it involves the uh, European uh, Parliament. 
Um, my prediction for the future in, uh, in Europe is that Europe will continue adopting our standards, uh, that it will uh, refrain. It, it has now one minor carve-out which affects 11 or 12 companies in uh, Europe. My prediction is that uh, the interests in uh, Europe are such that they will continue doing so, not making these carve-outs, but largely adopting uh, our standards. The um, feedback on the consultation that the European Commission uh, just did was so, um, so positive. And European businesses would get extremely upset if there were carve-outs left and right because they couldn't use their statements anymore for filing in, uh, in the United States. And they have tremendous interest in all countries around the world using self-restraint and adopting our standards as issued. Uh, because it's a huge cost saving for them and it is also makes it much easier for them to communicate with uh, investors. So I think there are sufficiently uh, sufficient positive incentives uh, also in Europe to uh, continue adopting standards, uh, endorsing our standards as they have done this far. Thank you. I'm sure given the audience there is any number of questions that could come our way, but I also realize that uh, you might be getting hungry and there's uh, some food uh, about to be served. So on behalf of the IFRS Foundation Trustees and the Accounting Standards Oversight Council, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, being here tonight and uh, joining in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.